it doesn't have to hurt to work. And so what can I do to dismantle my muscle bracing response? What can I do with the tool, no matter what the tool is, so that I can flip off my reactivity? So one of the challenges with, you know, stretch in general, like any stress, so a tool is a stretcher, right? When you put a tool on your body, it is stretching local tissue. And so your muscle spindles immediately are like, hey, I don't want to stretch. I don't like that. I'm going to break. And so what you feel when the tool is applied to your body is your body's own resistance to stretch. Just like you were trying to do a couch stretch or if you were just trying to do a, a, a ch you know, a chest stretch with your, your palm against the wall and stretching your bicep and, and pecs. Okay. All right, My Muscle Project, welcome back to another episode. This week, we have on a friend of Tim Branson, Kelly, Sarah, and Julie, Juliet, uh, Jill Miller, who we followed for. Well, Raph, I think I first saw you with uh, a deflated like um, little ball rolling on it and I thought to myself, well, first of all, it's not hard enough, mm. okay? And second of all, you need to blow it up. Uh, but then you went on to explain to me for probably a good hour um, what you were doing and who you got it from and then... Uh, that's how I found out about you, Jill. Uh, but, uh, you know, having just followed your stuff for a while, it almost kind of seems like, and I don't want to give you any labels, but um, the anti-yoga person in a way. Uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if that's accurate, um, but there hasn't always been, uh, or the, the hardcore yoga community and you haven't always seen eye to eye. You've always um, had some interesting ideas about uh, just like maybe chronic yoga practice for lack of a better term. So, I think yes, maybe that's a... That's that's a, a Good place to That's start great, is um, great place to start. Yeah, how you kind of fell into <laughs> that sort of camp or that sort of label that they were giving. How I was how I was excommunicated <laughs> from from yoga yeah. and uh, had to <laughs> figure out who I was. You know, it's like the uh, the greatest uh, trauma to a human is to be expelled from their own peer mm -hmm. group, right? Yeah. Um, but that's not really what happened. So I'm not. I'm certainly not anti yoga, but I created a dis I would call it a disruptive because that's the that's the catch term today. Um, a disruptive yoga format. And I really brought functional movement and self-massage into the yoga space because I thought that, first of all, people could probably perform asana or yoga poses better if they knew more about the human body, biomechanics, um, the subtle stuff, and but actually their anatomy and digging into the Latin rather than the Sanskrit to so that we would we could have cross- pollination and cross communication with other people in the movement and therapeutic world. Um, what was happening to me was I was doing chronic yoga. I love that term. I love the word chronic and anything because it just sounds so pathological and like <laughs> makes you seem like you're sick. Um, I was an addict. I was a yoga addict and I was a stretch addict. I was a dancer in college, but I started doing yoga when I was around 11 or 12. And I just I used it for self-regulation. It soothed me. Uh, I grew up in a house full of anxiety and um, a lot of drama, a lot of abuse, and it was really my sanctuary. So I used stretch and movement and especially yoga and the art of yoga to uh, console myself and to empower myself. But the long-term effects of that you know, chronic yoga were a degradation of my of the robustness of my fascial tissues and my connective tissue, my connective tissue body. And so um, here I am, you know, decades later, and I've just done um, a lot of, of personal, personal searching, personal research, but also lots of work in the lab, uh, lots of work in following and befriending major fascial, uh, fascial research titans, really to try to understand what it is that, um, I guess what it is that I undid in order to sort of redo in my body. It's been a really interesting journey, and um, I'm sure we'll talk about some of those things. But part of the journey is that I ended up having a total hip replacement at age 45, and I can easily attribute that to that chron th those days and nights of, of chronically stretching myself into the utmost silliest contortions that you can ever possibly imagine. 
What? So, uh, tell me about some of that lab work. Um, it's obviously uh, a piece to it that I'd say most yogis would never, uh, you know, never research or, or learn <laughs> about or even step into a lab. So, can what kind of stuff did you do there? What discoveries were made? Um, I think I was I was primed early. My father was a, is an infectious disease doctor, and so I grew up with his. Um, medical textbooks and medical journals around the house. So I was really into, I was really into disease and I love, I mean, he was an infectious disease doctor. So most of his journals were full of pages of people's bodies being eaten alive by viruses and funguses. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. And I was actually going to be a microbiologist. So I had a real, uh, real taste for biology and the sciences, but I ended up going into the moving arts. And um, in my Late twenties, early thirties. I was it late. I'm, I can't even time stamp it now. Maybe early thirties. I came across the work of a gentleman named Gil Headley, who is a anatomist in the U.S. And he opens his laboratory, his cadaver lab, to movement professionals like you and I, or other clinicians who actually don't get to work with cadavers. So, for example, acupuncturists don't get to do cadaver lab in their training. Um, uh, vocologists, people who specialize in the human voice, they don't get to do cadaver labs in their training. So there would be a real interesting uh, room full of people from so many different disciplines, all looking at the human body for different reasons. So um, Gill's original anatomy teacher was Tom Myers, who you might know from his model, The Anatomy Trains. And so he's been another huge influence. He and I are partnering and we're creating a program. Um, this summer, we're launching it called Rolling Along the Anatomy Trains. So I've had a a really interesting um, later life experience. I, I call this my grad school of being able to study with and befriending some of these uh, titans in the in the fascist space and being able to hold uh, hold a candle with my with the application of how we use the role model balls and the tools with people from every walk of life and every age and stage. Nice. What 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 tools in particular? Uh, when maybe you dug into the science of them, maybe surprised you or potentially like changed, you know, maybe you thought it was doing one thing or you thought something was particularly effective and then you took that tool and you're like, wow, it's like not effective or it's effective but in a different way to what I expected. Ah, oh man. So, gosh. Um, so, one, I think one assumption that people probably make about the tools because they're, you know, Here's here's a here's a let me just I'm gonna go big. So there's a bucket called self myofascial release, and unfortunately, this is the term that we're stuck with in terms of self massage. Mm. And there are so many tools, and there's a spectrum of tools. So you have you know you have large foam rollers, you have hard foam rollers, you have soft foam rollers, you have foam rollers that at their base level is PVC pipe. Other foam rollers, their base level is foam. Then you have roller sticks, right? People use roller sticks where they apply their, they use their arms and they roll these things up and down their body. Then you have all sorts of balls and knobs and, and other different objects. So self myofascial release is really a type of self massage that's intended to improve mobility using a tool, a stress transfer medium. Now you asked me a question. And unfortunately, what you don't know is that I'm actually writing a chapter on self myofascial release in a new medical textbook on fascia, along with a bunch of other uber nerds. And this is a book that's actually <laughs> going to, I mean, like it's going to the medical community. And so I, I just finished my first draft and now I'm in my second draft. And I've all I've been doing is reading papers on self myofascial release tools for the past four months. So <laughs> I don't think I've washed my hair um, and my eye my <laughs> it looks eyesight great. has changed no, it looks great. in these, oh, thank you. <laughs> my eyesight has changed in these last four months. And, and just today I was, I got a paper that was published three days ago that finally, finally um, is questioning this term self myofascial release, which has been dr driving me crazy for, for years because what we're, the, it's like we're stuck with this word, but we're actually not trying to release everything. Why would you want to release everything? Mm, yeah. Don't you just want to optimize your body and be able to move it and strengthen it and help it to feel? Um, can you imagine if you released everything? Like you would just fall apart in a puddle on the floor. So I think the challenge, are you having trouble with audio guys? No, you're good. Oh, good. 
He's yeah. just breathing so, really heavily, so I'm just warning him. Are you breathing heavily? Oh, I thought <laughs> I thought it was the dog. Okay. <laughs> um, Ralph, just through your nose, in and out. We'll talk about breathing, I'm sure. Um, so I think so. The question you asked um, is: Was have I been surprised by you know thinking the tool was doing one thing but was really doing another? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm surprised all the time by the reactions that my body has to to different tool applications. Um, I am extremely biased, even through all the, the reading, it's actually reinforced my bias about soft tools. Really? Um, because what soft tools do, so many of the, the neural mechanisms have been measured, but other neural mechanisms cannot be measured um, in these studies because we don't have instruments that can actually measure what's happening with Ruffini endings. Like we don't have measurements that can tell what all the different interstitial nerves, right? We have so many different types of proprioceptors in our tissues, but you, you can't actually say with, with like fact what is happening in each of these. So we know that, um, that it's not likely that a tool can actually um, eradicate an adhesion, but it certainly can mobilize a zone where adhesions or um, uh, thickening, fascial thickening exists. And that movement increase, the movement increase that we may be having there, they will, maybe it's not that the fascia is changing in the moment, but we're affecting, we're affecting the fluid environment, we're reflect, affecting blood perfusion, and we're affecting so many different of these mechanoreceptors in the zone, but also globally around the whole body. So all this to say that we know a little bit but we don't know a lot of what's happening. But mm. if it feels good to you and if it feels like it's improving your range of motion, if it feels like it's improving your proprioception, your coordination with a given movement or performance, um, by all means, you should keep doing what you're doing and tooling around and experimenting. Um, we're really lucky that one of our teachers, he's a she is a neurophysiologist, and in her PhD, she, she studied the Yogatuna balls in two of her studies, and she did some really interesting experiments to try to look at neurophysiological aspects of using the Yogatuna balls in, in um, conjunction with stretching. And she found, and she also studied not just healthy people, healthy young people, which most, most studies are college-age athletes because that's who's available on a campus. But she did a study for college-age humans, and then she replicated it with some changes, and she did middle-aged athletes, middle-aged humans, not middle-aged athletes, um, which is important because we need to look at populations that are that don't really don't give a shit about performance, that just want to prevent slip and falls as they age. Um, but what she found in her study, this is her name is Dr. Robin Capobianco, is that the rolling not only... Um, eliminated a, you know, when you stretch, when you do static stretching, you get a force deficit. So we know that static stretching feels great, but you're not going to have as much force production after you do a static stretch. It's just one of the lags that we have. Um, so she had people do a calf stretch and then she had them roll and the rolling overcame the force deficit caused by the stretch. And it made everybody have a substantial or significant torque improvement. Mm -hmm. So not only did their range of motion increase and last for, you know, 30 minutes that they were in the lab, um, but they all got stronger essentially in their uh, ankle plantar flexion. And so that's really good to know, especially as, you know, range of motion diminishes as we age, we know that. And, you know, the leading cause, <laughs> leading cause of mortality in people over 80 is slip and falls. And those slip and falls happen, those fractures happen in the hip, but they happen because people lose coordination in their, um, in their foot range of motion. And so um, I'm really encouraged by her research and it got published in like really kick-ass journals, uh, European Journal of Sports Science and the Journal of Sports Science. So very well um, evaluated. So, so was that rolling with um, the soft, Yoga tune-up balls? Yes. Or, okay. So not with the hard foam rollers? No, with yoga tune-up balls. Okay. And so, uh, and there's, you know, there's another study that I came across and, you know, not a lot of this, 
there's only really three studies that looked at hardness, but there's only one study or two studies, one's not published um, and one is published that actually looked at something called durometer. So durometer is the actual resistance of the rubber and you have to have a special instrument to measure durometer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it really taught, it really, it's about the, the, the distensibility or the compressibility of an object. So um, even though foam is very soft, when you have a, a black foam roller, it's very, very hard. Like an individual foam cell, you know, you could, you know, you're chewing on that when you're drinking your coffee cup, that when it's a long tube of that, it's actually quite hard to your tissue. Mm. So um, even though the word foam sounds soft, it's actually quite hard. Um, but the balls that we, we make are extremely um, squishy. They have a squish to them so that when they approximate bony prominences on your body, they don't annoy, bruise, or um, pinch your skin. They actually indent around the bony prominence. So the, so the ball, because it has grip, can actually grab a hold of all of the soft tissue layers at a joint. And that improves the stimulation of all these nerve endings and improves your coordination as well as tamps down sympathetic outflow. Mm. So I'm a, I'm a, as, Again, I'm a, I'm a soft tissue. I'm a, definitely a soft tool bias, um, but they have some great results using hard tools also, but not in the areas of chronic pain that um, a lot of the studies, a lot of the research just does not talk about um, people with chronic pain or specific conditions. So those were few and far between, but I did find some really interesting studies, um, some long-term studies, people with TMJ or pelvic floor pain and these were not using foam rollers um, on these people. So I think a lot of the research that the training community is familiar with is more foam roller biased. But I think that, um, you know, the world is a really big place. And um, like, what is it like 80% of the opiates in the whole world are consumed by Americans. And I don't think they're all just like, you know, CrossFitters. I mean, I think that <laughs> we have a really big pain problem globally. And so we need to be looking at I think um, a more broad spectrum of what these tools can do for, for social medicine, right? Keep people out of a clinic, mm. keep people away from surgery and getting addicted to those pills. Yeah. So it's interesting because yeah, that using those, those soft balls, you know, I generally when I think most people avoid rolling or any self-work is because it's so painful. Um, and then, exactly. But they also associate that with, with better, like I know, I know when sometimes you get a massage, for example, people rate how effective the massage was versus of how sweaty they end up or how much pain they were in at the end of it. Um, but kind of, it sounds like what you're saying is that's not necessarily a good indicator of whether it was effective or not. If if someone was to foam roll, like in that study with their calves on the softballs, what level of pain would they expect versus, say, like a deep tissue massage, like where? Because it sounds like th that's the benefits I want of the of the soft foam rolling um, to to yes. kind of yeah increase torque like you said and also increase range of motion. But um, how much do I have to suffer compared to like a, a deep tissue massage? Yeah, I love your question, Lachlan. It doesn't have to hurt to work. Mm -hmm. And so, what can I do to dismantle my muscle bracing response? What can I do with the tool? no matter what the tool is, so that I can flip off my reactivity. So one of the challenges with, you know, stretch in general, like any stress, so a tool is a stretcher, right? When you put a tool on your body, it is stretching local tissue. Mm. And so your muscle spindles immediately are like, hey, I don't want to stretch. Mm. Don't like that. I'm going to break. And so what you feel when the tool is applied to your body is your body's own resistance to stretch just like you were trying to do a couch stretch or if you were just trying to do a, a, a ch you know, a chest stretch with your, your palm against the wall and stretching your bicep and, mm -hmm. and pecs. So there was a, I'll, I'll talk about this one Korean study that like is so good. It was so well done because they did it with people in the sixties, which like no studies are done on people in their sixties. And all these people had chronic neck pain. And so they were actually looking at a condition and they put a lacrosse ball behind the necks of these individuals. So they put it like on, on a yoga block. So they laid them down. They had all these measurements, like amazing measurements. The Koreans are like really good with all these beats and the scans. And that's the part of the studies I don't understand is, is all the tech. But 
uh, it was um, um, a little bit of a block or a block, a lacrosse ball, and then they put their bodies, um, their neck on it. And then they had a, a hollow soft ball. So something like, um, you know, like, like, you know, this is my yoga tune up ball. Mm. So it was um, in terms of the durometer, it was, it was about the squish, let's say of a gorgeous ball. So this is my gorgeous ball that I'm holding up. So they had like a, the same size of a lacrosse ball size of a soft inflated rubber ball. And what they found was that the, the soft ball, they got massive increases in range of, or significant increases in range of motion, and there was no interference with the EMG. So the challenge with the hard ball, which they got no increases of range of motion, was that the ball itself created spasm mm. in all the neighboring muscles. So not only the target muscle was in spasm, but so were all the surrounding muscles that they were measuring. The traps, the levator scapula, mm. scalenes, all were, were like, oh, God, this ball is too hard. Mm. So that's really a kind of a perfect example of if the body not being able to let its guard down to let the rolling commence, to actually let the tissues be um, touched by the tool. And so all of us have a different pain pressure tolerance because of what we've adapted to or what we've trained to or what our nervous system allows us to um, receive in terms of pressure into our body. And so, yeah, rolling is very personal and people need to find that tool that really disarms them so they can be vulnerable, like literally vulnerable and let the tool penetrate to the degree that makes them feel comfortable, safe and, ple and pleasant. It shouldn't be an unpleasant um, experience. And so that's just going to be different from person to person. But on a global scale, a soft tool already disarms that muscle bracing response. And so that's a great on-ramp for people who are sensitive to touch, are afraid of deep touch. Maybe they are touch averse. They don't want to get a massage, but they need it. Um, there are so many other wonderful things that improve because of massage. I mean, you have... Um, it, it improves immune function. It improves proprioception. It's like on and on and on. So like, it, you know, it improves your vasculature health. You know, you get nitric oxide re released when you roll. Um, so like, and then some of the stuff I teach is extremely trunk centric. Um, we, we move all over the ribs with the gorgeous ball. We move all over the guts with the gorgeous ball. You don't want to have a hard, hard object you know, docking into your ovaries, not that you guys have one, but, or two, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, rolling into your liver and, the, you know, your stomach and pancreas. So you want to have light pressures that can mobilize your intestines. You know, you don't really, it's, this are, you're hearty, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you're, Still you're not a robot. Yeah. yeah. And well, how, sorry, how does the, uh, how does the feedback work with, often when you're rolling, you like some spots, you can have the same pressure on it in one spot you feel nothing and then like one inch down, it's like intense pain. Is it, is the general rule that most people think that the spot that hurts the most is the most important spot to be doing it or totally. is that misleading? Everybody. Yeah. Everybody wants to go where the pain is. Um, but often the pain is there uh, because of imbalances elsewhere that are just getting log jammed there or sensitized there. Um, what some of the studies were really interesting. I haven't done this experiment on myself yet, but some of the studies, they like roll the quad on one leg and then they measure, I can't remember what the, I just came across this like the other day, so I can't remember all of it, but they, but basically what they found is that the range of motion improved on the other leg. So they're, you know, they roll the right quad, then they test the right knee for knee flexion. And then they test the left. Well, of course, they tested both knees before right. any of the rolling. But they got the same improvements on the non-rolled leg. Wow. Um, and so what, what it's pointing to is that it's not just where you're rolling that gets a local improvement. But there's some, and this is where the neural mechanics come in, but there's an effect that's going all the way to your brain, your central nervous system, and probably, you know, and your ANS that's improving, that's really disarming the that tension globally for your body so that, you know they probably could have tested the toes too and found that there was more range of motion there or the ankle or something other something else obvious like that or even the shoulder possibly but you know further studies are needed so to your to your question 
um, like, you know, people are going to roll hot spots. Like I roll hot spots. I get hot spots in my, my neck and shoulders from being a, a neck forward person at the computer all day and holding my kids um, and just the way I sleep. So, you know, I know the spots that I, you know, I, I know if I rub certain spots, I'll actually get them to completely ease and that, 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 that feeling of tension will disappear. Um, and then it'll show back up the next morning because of the way I slept. Hmm. But, you know, I wouldn't discourage people from going to those hot spots, but it's not necessarily that spot that's the, uh, the cause of the discomfort. Hmm. So, yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah, I remember when well, the most tangible time I felt like the, we, were, we were able to distinguish between that moment where your body, like you said, becomes vulnerable, lets its guard down for, for whatever um, you know, pressure you're applying to it is, I can't remember what the, the term is called for them, but they're basically a mat with lots of little spikes on it. And mm. uh, have you used one of these? It's a sleep mat. Yeah, mm. and you used it for sleep. It was whatever bulletproof said the benefits were. I mean, they throw benefits on, on everything that company, but... It was effective, but basically, essentially, for people listening, imagine you just like rolled out like a, a tea towel size mat and on it is like all these little plastic spikes. Whereas if you stood yeah. on it, you'd feel like you just, you know, cut your foot. That's how sharp they are. And bed, bed, of, bed of nails is what those are called. Right, right. That's, uh, that's basically I mean, some, how I would yeah. describe the feeling. But it's, <laughs> it's funny because you lie on it at first. You're supposed to lie on your back and the feeling of it is like that you're being like you're actually bleeding, like you're cut and bleeding, that it's it's so, so sharp. But within, uh, I want to say it's like five minutes, mm. two to five minutes, depending on how good you get at it, you ha- feel this very instant switch over to uh, c- total relaxation and then you can't actually feel the spikes on your back anymore. Yeah. And whatever that, that protective mechanism is, it just completely switched off like in an instant. Yeah. And you get this yeah. overwhelming sensation of just down regulation and you come off the mat and it's like I'm ready to go to bed. Like you're exhausted. It's it's pretty incredible. Yeah, you just you got your opiate receptors just get flooded with you know endorphins with endogenous morphine. Right. Right. So eventually, yeah, that that um, the, your body just adapts to it. Yeah, compression. You know, compression blankets have a similar thing. Okay. So they're just working on different um, you know different nerve ending different nerve endings that frankly end up rejiggering your your body's responses mm. so that sounds wonderful mm. that there was a time when every other every other time i opened instagram somebody wanted to send one of those to me and i, I never accepted it i should have i'm so jealous i want to go lay on that's right you right. get them for three bucks on ebay like yeah. they're just they're, they're nothing special like anyone who anyone who put more than five dollar price tag on it is just ripping you off so yeah, it's not it's nothing that special. But um, I actually wanted to ask a question. You, you did actually touch on it earlier about breathing. Um, we've had quite a few breath experts on. Uh, we haven't had Wim mm-hmm. Hof, but we've had people who have contested some of his, his claims. Um, one of the guys was Patrick McEwen. I don't know if you know him. Um, oh, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, he's got great stuff. Um, oh, his book is so good. Oh, it's incredible. And yeah. w- w- one of the questions that I sort of had for you was, you know, he didn't he didn't talk about he talked about the mechanics of breathing and mm-hmm. why we need to breathe a certain way, but he didn't talk about the 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 different muscles and structures yeah. that are involved in breathing and how if they're tight or if there's dysfunction there or if there's injury to those muscles that it might that it might be hard to overcome those um, limitations with your mm-hmm. own breathing um, if you don't somehow fix them um, so is that a thing? Like, can people, if people need to improve their breathing, they, you know, they breathe more through their diaphragm or they need to breathe more through their nose or whatever, but they can't because they have like adhesions or tightness or maybe their, their shit's just whack for lack of a better term. How, so how can they improve? Whack. How can they improve that? Do they need to improve that? Or can yeah. you just simply improve breathing by just switching over to nose breathing and focusing on your diaphragm? Um, I, I think what he teaches is super important and he's a great educator on the physiology of respiration. Um, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I love the physiology and I love the mechanics and I love the fascial interfaces of the diaphragm to all of your structure. So I think it's really important that the health of the musculoskeletal system is, uh, is addressed in the context of learning respiration so that you're optimizing everything. Mm. Um, you know, 
through changing the way you breathe, you can get rid of back pain. I've seen it. Mm. Through changing the way you breathe, you can eliminate acid reflux. I've seen it. Um, through changing the way you breathe, you can change the way your bowel movements are. I've seen it. But what I do is I induce mobility into all of the structures. Excuse me. I I teach people to induce mobility into all of, of the zones of respiration is what I call it. So we have these three zones. There's the abdominal zone, there's the thoracic zone, and there's the clavicular zone. And we um, basically pendulate between these three different zones depending on our internal and external stresses that we're dealing with. If you're in an emergency situation, you want to have your clavicular respirators on so that you can get out of a situation. Um, if you're lifting heavy loads, you want your thoracic respirators to be dominant so that you're not going to tweak your lower back. Um, but if you're meditating or um, needing to be in a calm, cool, collected uh, way, you want to make sure that you are able to do abdominal breathing, right? Subdiaphragmatic breathing. So these three zones of respiration, um, they're, they're controlled by, of course, nerve impulses, right? So the, the phrenic nerve fires and the the diaphragm contracts and it descends. And then once your, you know, your blood level, your uh, oxygen saturation level is met for whatever demands are, that contraction or that the phrenic nerve flips off. And this is all vaguely mediated, medi mediated by the vagus nerve, you know, superior to the, the phrenic. And then your diaphragm uh, goes home and it rests inside of the ribs. But if I have um, if I have chronic tension in my transversus abdominis, I, is this on camera? Are you guys seeing me? Yeah, are other yeah. people going to see me? Yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah, obviously, and people he, that are just listening to this, you should probably check out the YouTube video. Uh, if it wasn't obvious. Yeah, so I'll try to describe it for people who are not able to watch. So, the transversus abdominis is in the same exact fascial layer as your respiratory diaphragm. And so, as the diaphragm descends and ascends, if there is an inordinate amount of tension, in the transversus abdominis, um, from uh, chronic uh, a chronic behavior of holding your gut in because you want to look skinny, or because you have scar tissue that has adapted strange tensions throughout the gut, and this can happen because you've had a hernia, you had a gallbladder surgery, you had a C-section, you had an appendectomy, you had an umbilical hernia earlier in life, um, or you had back surgery. So anything that has invaded your your gut area surgically can be a scar that inhibits the full range of motion of that transversus, which means that the respiratory diaphragm does not have balanced pressure below it. And then below, below that, of course, is the pelvic floor. So that's a whole other reciprocal uh, movement uh, unit that should move in tandem with the descent and the ascent of the respiratory diaphragm. Uh, this is often referred to as a soft tissue piston, right? I think uh, Julie Wiebe describes that. She's a wonderful physical therapist here in Los Angeles. So um, this is why we do uh, rolling on the abdomen with the gorgeous ball so that the soft tissues within the, the gut canister, so that's the transversus, it's the obliques, but posterior to that, it's your lats, right? So the lats are covering the obliques and the transversus abdominis, and of course, other deeper layers, erector spinae, quadratus lumborum, all of these soft tissues of your um, subdiaphragmatic zone, they are a part and parcel of this uh, abdominal mechanic. Above that, you have the, the rib cage. You have 24 ribs. <laughs> like, don't just think of it as like a humerus. These are 24 ribs that may or may not work in tandem with each other, right? Sometimes you've got 24 different oars on your boat and they're rowing at opposite, in opposite ways and not in a way that's extremely helpful to uh, a body. Right, so we have we have scoliosis that we're born with. We have scoliosis that we create, and the ribs are gonna they're gonna rotate in tandem with how you carry your body and how you breathe your body. So um, we do exercises that mobilize the ribs, full range of motion, put pressures on the chest, the side of the, the side of the ribs, back of the ribs, um, and do all sorts of different breath strategies, different kinds of breath holds, different compressive breath holds, super fun stuff. Um, to make sure that these ribs are, they're rowing the, they're rowing the same boat, which is you, um, in a way that optimizes thoracic breathing. Because mm -hmm. you want to be able to brace maximally in your core um, during, 
you know, during high loaded movements. Mm. Uh, I recently had a student write to me after he did a one and a half hour workshop in Canada this past April at the Toronto Yoga Conference. And I think he took a, he took a, a workshop called Six Pack Diaphragm. So I taught a workshop called Six Pack Diaphragm that's all about uh, helping you to disassemble or um, perceive the myofascial interfaces of the respiratory diaphragm. So to everything that it's connected to. And so he writes me a couple of days later and he's go, he writes me, he said, you know, I've had a, a hemi, um, my right diaphragm has been paralyzed for the past year and a half because I got a bacterial infection. And my doctor said, eh, eventually it'll, it'll come back. But literally, he's only been breathing out of his left side of his rib cage for the past year and a half. And this guy's a meditation teacher. He's not like just Joe Schmo off the street. Like he know, he's like in touch with his body. Can you imagine how frustrating that would be mm. to only feel inflation on one half of your body and what that would do to your neck, shoulder, hip, butt, foot on the other side? I just cannot even imagine what that must have been like. But he wrote to me and he says, I'm pretty sure my right diaphragm is moving now. I can completely feel it. it's back. Could, did that happen in our workshop from the, from the rolling and the stimulation? And I was like, probably. Sounds like that's probably what happened is we just kicked it back into gear. And so then he went to his doctor and they did all the ultrasounds and confirmed that, yes, indeed, he's back online and that I should, he should keep doing what he learned in the workshop for me. So, you know, this is... We get stories like this all the time. And um, I love his story because it was such total paralysis. Um, and then I have some other like uh, students that have written to me from remote who I didn't work with directly, but just indirectly were messing around and have had things like this happen to them. And that that third zone of respiration is the, um, is the, we call it the supraclavicle zone. So that's everything above the collarbone. And this is the stress muscles of respiration. And by the way, each of these zones also has very specific vagal, vagus nerve innervation. And so this is something that um, we talk about or we teach for days and days in one of my, my favorite course out of the eight courses I teach called the breath and bliss immersion. So you just happen to ask me about my favorite topic. Um, but in the, in the neck area, you would be shocked at the challenges with uh, vocal production, with um, vocal strain, with neck mobility, um, with uh, even facial expressivity, uh, movements of the jaw that can be helped by doing uh, mobilizations and breath strategies for the face, neck, and head using like the cordless ball or the or the little yoga tuna ball. So the, this area also, I mean, this is your this is where you suck stuff in, and it's where you let the stuff out. So there are, there are other ways to optimize your, your snout and your throat um, so that uh, breathing is even more delicious and um, more equanimous. Mm. Yeah, it's so funny. yes, I, that... I love everything Patrick talks about, but I do think that we have ways of um, you know, getting you closer to heaven with, um, with your biology here. Yeah, of course. Um... No, it's interesting. You mentioned that, like, yeah, when someone would be dysfunctional or the, the guy who was paralyzed on his right side, it would affect, just have such an up and downstream effect to all the other different structures in, in, structures in his body. So it just makes me think about how chronically overworked people's um, trap areas are and shoulders and stuff that are in like really high stress, high stress uh, careers. We see it so often is like we get people to come in. And we work on some diaphragm breathing with them and some, some awareness drills. And their whole upper neck and all the tension through their shoulders is, is gone. But one of the things that uh, comes as a side effect, and I'm always unsure what it means, is they feel like a bit nauseous or they feel a bit yeah. sick. Um, can you sort of explain what's going on there? It's like we get them to relax. We get them to breathe a bit better. And then sometimes I've had people say, they're not like they're going to throw up, but they go, oh, I feel a bit sick after they did that. Um, what, what's going on there? Uh, well, it could be lots of different things. Um, you know, one, there's a phenomenon called um, uh, anxiety-induced relaxation. So sometimes when the body does start to unwind and get vulnerable, there are other, other defenses crop up. And so it's not like they feel sick. Um, is it's not like 
that is happening, but it's like they're not really sick, but their body is trying to, in a sense, get them out of the unpleasantness of becoming vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that can happen. Um, but also just a tolerance to um, CO2 in the body can make you feel dizzy, can make you feel high and make you feel out of control. And so feeling out of control like that, um, that's going to take some um, optimization. It's going to take some acclimating mm. to become more comfortable with, with the extra CO2 load in the body. That would be my, we hear this, we do hear this frequently. Mm. So does so exhaling help with that? that? Um, hopefully they're already exhaling. Are they already exhaling? <laughs> they're just, they're just holding their breath the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully exhaling. <laughs> it's a, it's an important strategy. Um, changing changing the stimulation can. So you can change the stimulation by having them drink water. Um, you can have them um, start to um, uh, touch something with their hands. Um, you can have them rub their feet. So just something that can sort of, uh, if they can't tolerate it. Some people are like, you know, I feel sick, but I'm interested in this feeling. I want to go deeper into this experience. So often on the other side of that, there's insight. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I wanted to touch, I know you mentioned this or you've talked about it quite a few times, um, but you did get that hip replacement. I did get that hip that replacement. Just, yeah, you want to see my hip? It's a real thing. Here. Yeah, here you go. Right, here Those you of go. you who are on video, oh, oh, wow. you, yeah, that's right. it's still in the formaldehyde because I... I don't know where to dispose of my formaldehyde, but um, someday I will. What, so what, what is that? Is that... Oh, this is, this is my hip. This is my femur. I know, but oh, is that like a chunk of your femur? Dude, it's my femur, not a chunk of it. They had to, you know, they had to saw it off oh. in order to put a proper, uh, you know, titanium ball and a rod inside my body. That is Amazing. not as... So it fits it like a coffee cup now. Surprising. <laughs> it was the cup that came from the um, from the lab, man. That's the, from the pathology lab. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Have you? How is it? Um, <laughs> how's the recovery been? Like, what were the strategies of recovery that you used um, that you felt like were most effective? Now, I'm sure uh, yeah. there was still some elements of yoga in there. Um, so, no. What have, no, not at all. No, so, I don't really, I don't really do yoga. Okay. I teach yoga too enough. So right. I teach I, I teach people about their body, um, teach movement. I teach uh, down regulation, breath mechanics, rolling, um, but I don't really teach asana. So my recovery, yeah, it's, it's like, what does Jill do to work out? I kind of doodle, uh, I move around, I do lots of different things. Um, it, it looks like moving meditation and, um, okay, so I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be glib, I had some very, very, I had a very good rehab team. Um, I investigated my rehab team before surgery because, and I would advocate I would tell anybody who is prepping for a major surgery or a joint replacement that you need to get your rehab team ahead of time. Don't be in a desperate place and be and settle yourself with uh, um, a team where you do not feel like you can trust them or um, are complacent about your 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 rehab. So I'm really happy that I found like just the most ideal physical therapist for me who happens to be one mile from my house. So I got really lucky that way. But what rehab looked for me is I got a surgeon. First of all, I got a surgery. You guys can get it in Australia or you can get a like surgery. So I got a surgery that was pioneered by a man called Jason Snibby. He's the, I think he's one of two people doing it in the US and it's called the direct superior approach. And it's an innovation on a procedure called the PATH approach which I'm pretty sure they're doing in Australia, um, where they go in and they actually cut the piriformis and they reflect it back. And then they, they, you know, obviously they have to cut the joint capsule, they take the bone out. You know, so they re-sew the piriformis and then they move back along the scar path and then sew, sew you up. You only have about a four inch scar. Um, the, um, what's it called? The prosthesis that I have is dual mobility. It's a striker dual mobility. And that this is a new type of tech. It's I think in the current in the last five years, which leaves me with no movement precautions. So prior to this, you get a hip replacement, you're going to have a movement precaution of you can't do hip flexion with adduction, um, but that's not the case. I, I have no movement precautions, and the likelihood of needing a revision is is less than one percent. So this is a lifelong um, prosthesis. So again, this is very new tech. I'm 
so happy that I live in LA and this doctor was right here. Um, so that's not the case for all people. But um, if you, you hurt, you're hearing me now, and if, you're, if you know that you've got a degenerating hip and that you're going to need a hip replacement, look for a surgeon who will um, get you this, get you a surgery that, uh, and a prosthesis that will last your lifetime. Like you should advocate yeah. for that for yourself. And there's other approaches that use this prosthesis. So an anterior approach uses it. I just really liked that this was an outpatient procedure. I wanted to go home and nurse my son and I did. So I walked in at 6.30 a.m. and I walked out with a walker at 12.30 p.m. So it was a six hour process for me. Um, and by the time I left the car to you know walk to my, <laughs> walk to my bed, um, I had crutches. And then I think I used the crutches maybe just a little bit more that day. I switched to the cane right away. And by day four, I wasn't using the cane anymore. Holy shit. Um, yeah. And I was just walking and you can look through my Instagram feed. If you use the hashtag, the role remodel, R O L T H E R O L L R E M O D E L. You can follow all of my hip replacement posts. And I, I say that because there's a lot of people, a lot of people out there with degenerating hips that I have met or with, you know, post hip surgery. It's been a very, very cool club of people that I've met mm. cops fighters, yoga teachers, dancers, pole dancers, athletes. It's mm. been amazing. Mm. Um, people are falling apart out there, guys. Mm. Okay. So, but the rehab, so I had a great, I, had, I did PT on day one. Um, and I, it was a very long process. So the types of things we did in PT included um, something called red cord. You guys have that down there in Australia? No, doesn't really no. Tell. Um, yeah, so red cord and a lot of PNFs for sure. Uh, all manner of different apparatus. My my physical therapist, her name is Lethal McCurdy. She would put me into the most uncomfortable positions and say, "Okay, now get it stronger," which is kind of like what you do in personal training. Yeah. Um, I I'm still doing, I would say, considerable rehab on my piriformis. So I was, you know, finally discharged from PT. And then the modalities that have really helped me to accelerate my healing and my strength have been hit. Hit as in <laughs> high intensity training? I was in like what I wouldn't have done before surgery. Like I would never, you would never catch me like doing hit classes twice a week. Yeah. But my friend, Doc Jen, uh, Doc Jen Fit, she's on Instagram. Um, she's a physical therapist and she's a friend of mine here in LA. She's got a great online program. And so I'll do her videos like twice a week. Um, and then I've been doing FRC stuff because I had a feeling that doing end range PNFs was going to really help me with the scar tissue at the site of my piriformis. Mm. Um, so I've been doing some stuff with um, Hunter. I'm sure you guys are familiar yeah. with uh, Hunter. Um, and then I've just been doing a lot of my own stuff, which is my own in like yoga tune-up work and role model work and just a mishmash of all those things. Nice. But I can say that stimulating, <sighs> stimulating the, the hip in novel ways with great regularity is what has led to the greatest robustness of, of everything. Yeah. Um, and I would say to that, this is really the human, the human body really responds to novel stimuli. And if you find yourself complacent in any tract of exercise modality or fitness that it's really important to force yourself out of your box because your body loves to adapt. Um, one of the new programs that I've been also investigating and then bringing into my, my bone life is the work of Gary Ward, who is the author of what the foot. And I know he's got some trainers down in Australia. Um, so that work he's, uh, companies call it anatomy in motion. Um, and I was able to go to his seminar, this past uh, year in April. And that's been really helpful too. It reminds me of Feldenkrais. So very, very subtle stuff, extreme, extreme stuff, and everything in between. But it's just been like learning to walk again. It really is. It's been like, you know, Jill 2.0 is mm. what I feel. That's awesome. I think there's some really good insights and advice in there, especially just like the novelty, right? Just keeping the body 
it just adapts so quickly. So if you just keep doing a very limited um, amount of stuff, then you're going to get a very limited amount of function. Um, so yes. that's that's something that, that we try and incorporate all the time. I did want to, um, before we jump into our final four questions, I want to ask a bit of a personal uh, question. My and I, I haven't I haven't got answers for this, um, so may, and maybe you don't either. But um, you might have some insights into it. But uh, so my mum's side of family, so her her mother, my my uh, grandmother, um, and then my mum and her brother, so my uncle, all three uh, at varying points in their life, uh, somewhere between like forty and sixty years old, have gotten a frozen shoulder. Uh, oh, in, in in both in both shoulders, uh, but at different times. And and just recently, uh, my mum and her brother. Uh, I think he, my uncle's about late fifties, and mum's also late fifties. Uh, they they both had yeah, they both got frozen shoulder right now at the same time. And they've seen a few specialists. Um, someone who's supposedly one of the best uh, shoulder guys in in Sydney, a uh, physio. And he's like, you know, it is. we do seem to think it's genetic and we seem to think that there's actually really nothing we can do to have it come on or like when when we've got it, there's some exercises that we can do and stuff, but really it's just kind of a matter of time and we're just going to keep the range that we have healthy. Uh, for people that don't know what a uh, frozen shoulder is, you'll probably do a better job of kind of explaining it to people, Jill, so maybe you could do that first and then do you have any experiences with healing it or do you have any theories as to why it comes on or just some more insights? Oh boy. My, I mean, my theories are going to be just what, what's kind of out there. Right. They don't know what brings it on. Yeah. So it's a combination of fascial thickening, um, a tremendous amount of fluid adhesion that basically bloats the fascia. And um, so then because you have all these nerve endings embedded within the fascia, uh, you have a tremendous amount of pain and then you have movement inhibition because the muscles basically are getting strangled and starved. And so that's lessening your force production. So, um, yeah, my mother had it for about two years and usually the life cycle is about two years mm. on, on a, um, a frozen shoulder. Uh, you know, she doesn't live with me, so I wasn't able to work on her, but when she would come out here, I would send her to my Cairo uh, who's amazing. He's an amazing soft tissue guy. Um, and I would get to watch him work on her. So really my mother's frozen shoulder was the first experience I had, uh, being around a frozen shoulder. I had a, a student who had a frozen shoulder. It had already healed by the time she came to me. And so we were, she was just like experiencing so much freedom with every progressive class because of, I guess the adapt adaptations that her body was going through in our, in our course, but her frozen shoulder was, you know, mostly healed by the time she got to me. So she was in that like last 10% and we got her that last 10% just through, through movement and rolling. But my mom, you know, what probably like your relatives, she couldn't lift, she couldn't, you know, flex her shoulder. So she would just, you know, use her scapula, yeah. um, which just compounds more of that tension upon tension. Yeah. So he, what, uh, my my feeling with most um, acute, well, acute with most chronic uh, pain stuff is the first thing to address is nervous system. And so if you can get that person into a place uh, where they can tolerate being relaxed, so we mentioned that not everybody can tolerate being relaxed. So we want to trick their nervous system into letting... Um, entering into a very deep state of parasympathetic dominance. Um, these are, you know, this is something that all the yoga tune-up teachers and role model teachers do using the balls and position and breath. And once they are, you know, not asleep, but they're in a very deep state of relaxation, um, then the nervous system feels safer to allow movement that it wouldn't normally allow. And so I'm just, you know, it, this is, you know, if I were working with a person with frozen shoulder, that's what we would do first is we would um, settle down the nervous system. And then we would just start talking to different structures using, you know, the various size balls and then uh, moving in a safe range and that, and graduating that safe range, which is probably what, you know, what, what any gifted hands-on therapist would do with that person. But I think you've got to address their state first. So you have to um, help them to, um, disarm the conscious and unconscious muscle bracing. Cause that's what's happening in that, 
inflamed zone. There's so much unconscious muscle bracing, plus there's all the uh, the other um, fluid, nerve ending, and you know solidified lymph. I mean, it's just a mess in there, and so it needs <laughs> manual work. It needs manual work. Like mm. it needs to to get the hyaluronan to start gliding again, and that really only happens through movement or through the transfer and movement from a hand or a tool into that, into that flesh. I don't think it's genetic. I, I, I don't, I don't know what, we don't know why it happens, but I don't think it's genetic. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, did you want to shoot a personal What's question? Total opinion. <laughs> uh, nothing, nothing frozen. Uh, but the hip stuff nothing. was interesting. And um, I've seen a few people get like the posterior hip replacement, like you mentioned, and the anterior um, or superior hip replacement you mentioned uh, in my family. And it seems like the one through the front is like incredibly better than the one through the back. I don't know why. Maybe some people have to get it through the back, but there's a huge difference in the recovery time and just how inconvenient the whole process is. Oh, man, you got super jumbled there, your microphone. So oh, you, you were right? saying the recovery time. Yeah, with the with... hip replacement. So you mentioned you got, uh, I think, anterior or superior. So from the front. I got something incision. called direct superior. Um, so you can see my scar on Instagram if you're like wondering, like, what's she talking about? Because it's not posterior, it's not anterior, it's on the side of my of my tushy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, it's just yeah, the recovery tushy. time is uh, it's like way way lower than people that get it through the back. Because I've seen this like similar family members get it through the back, um, and it's just like I don't know, it's a huge ordeal. Oh gosh, it's a huge ordeal. Like when they cut your glute max. Mm. Oh my gosh, leave my Max alone. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Pretty big yeah. muscle, right? But like in 10 years, you're not even going to need, you're not going to need metal in 10 years. They're going to have fake bone. I mean, they're using 3D printers right now to create hum human bone. Yeah. Like, hang on if you can, everybody, because <laughs> it's... <laughs> You know, we're, we're going to be like just regenerating sh stuff. You're not even going to need a hip replacement. No, you're going to need a hip replacement. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, I don't know where we're going to get to that point where we regenerate our own limbs, but that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's like stem cells and stuff. There's probably some, some cool shit that's out there that they're working on at the moment. I'm sure that like, you know, it'll be surgery and then a series of, of four stem cell injections. And then it's like a week later, you're back to normal. You get, you get your hip, mm -hmm. like your ribs broken in a rugby game and they'll print a new one at half time you'll be, <laughs> half you'll, be, time. you'll be straight back out there half, half time put the new rib in yeah no that's good that's good um all right well i want to get into these final four questions i'm curious uh, about these answers uh, okay so the first question jill is uh, if you had an opportunity to sit down and interview anyone that's alive today um who would you interview and why assuming that everything you ask them they would answer openly and honestly oh um, so I have a massive intellectual crush on Dr. Stephen Porges, who's the uh, creator of polyvagal theory. So he's the most well, uh, most, um, uh, he's the guy who that quantified HRV, first of all. Mm. Um, but his whole uh, research is centered around the vagus nerve and its influence through our um, neonatal and developmental experience. Um, he has studied the evolution of the vagus nerve and his book, The Polyvagal Theory, uh, changed my life and has changed the, the course of my programming. It's been the most influential, you know, <laughs> work. So I would like to ask him about some very specific research mm -hmm. that I have not been able to um, dive into as fully as I want to. And so this is going to seem like more like on a ladies podcast right now, but um, he's done a lot of research on babies who as, um, aspirate meconium when they're in the birth canal. And do you know what that is, gentlemen? No, no, idea. no? okay. So that's basically the first poop. Okay. So um, usually, baby, it, when some, you know, when babies go into distress, they will defecate, just like you'll defecate if you go into a life threat situation. So for some babies coming out of the body, they experience this reaction and they, they defecate and then they breathe, they take their first breath and unfortunately it's their own bowels. And this can create an additional life threat in, in, um, uh, situation for those babies. So anyway, I want to talk to him about that research. Mm. 
Wow. Is that something that you had? Was that a personal experience that you had with your kids? Is that why you're curious about um, that? My, my daughter, my daughter was, it was a great labor. It was a great birth, but um, she aspirated a considerable amount. She did not need to go to the NICU, luckily. But I just wonder about his research and um, what he's found for later life, later in life, because yeah. they're finding that certain birth traumas are predictive of certain later in life conditions. So I'm just curious about that. And um, I'm very moved by his research. Mm. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, I'm sure you weren't expecting that answer. Was, I was just about to say, I was not expecting you to say that. But uh, You're like, oh, you want to talk about breathing and poop. Interesting, Bill. <laughs> yeah, I want to talk about <laughs> breathing. Two of my favorite and subjects. Poop. I just never put them together like that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, but it's relevant. Look, there are people listening to this that, you know, need to know this stuff. Like it's Absolutely. stuff that we want to know about, you know, so it's important. Um, second question, is uh, there anything that you do every single day or you try and do most days you feel like makes a big difference, makes, uh, makes the day more successful if you get it done? Yes, absolutely. Having goof time and cuddle time with my kids. Nice. How, um, how old are your kids? I have a five-year-old girl and I have a two and three-quarter-year-old little boy. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Do you, um, And they are everything. How do you handle their uh, curiosity? How do you handle their, their, their digital wellness or their screen time? There is none. Oh, complete, complete abstinence. Well, how will you handle it in the future? Or how do you plan to handle it? Well, this morning, Lila was asking me if she could... I talked about a ferret. Just like, can I see a ferret? And so I pulled up a picture of a ferret on my phone and showed her. And then she started thinking of other exotic animals so that I would pull up pictures of the other exotic animals on my phone and show her. And so I did. Mm. So that's kind of how, you know, we'll use it like that. Um, or uh, I'll take a picture of her and she'll, she'll want to see it. Mm. So it's very innocent and light like that. Um, how will I do it in the future? Dude, it's coming. So I don't... I am... Yeah, I can feel it coming like an anvil, you know, like that's just hanging over my head. Mm. And I don't think we've made that decision yet. I mean, I know that she's going to have to use um, iPads or whatever in school and um, we'll just cross the bridge when we get there. But so far, we've been able to keep um, her away from devices for five years. And um, my intention is to go all the way to five years with my son as well. And so if she has something, he'll want it. So I think she's going to be kind of, you know, very tech free or almost no tech all the way up until, you know, age seven. Mm. Is that because that's you're worried I, about the damaging effects of like blue light and sort of um, the effect of heavy dopamine release on like developing brains? Oh, for sure. Yes. I mean, I, I I've read the research and I know my, I know what an addict I am. Mm. I mean, unfortunately they've already seen my husband and myself rely on tech for our business nonstop. I mean, we are, we are a digital, digital delivery company as well. I mean, like this is our income. You're know, talking to you. Like this is, in, this is, this is a, a, a energy exchange. Like this is how we're living life now, but she doesn't need to do that right now. Mm. She doesn't need to make her living on a computer. Mm. She, Oh, we will occasionally do FaceTime with grandma. Okay. Yeah. But she doesn't, she doesn't even ask to do FaceTime. Like she doesn't really, she's not really interested in it. Mm. So I think that's cool. Yeah. I just don't think like torching the dopamine receptors at such a young, at such young developing ages can have any positive effects later in life to especially developing brains. Like imagine how their receptors um, are going to form uh, later in life. Like they're going to be, I would imagine they're going to be really cooked. They're going to be dull. So things that would cause, you know, pleasure or just happiness um, will yeah. not anymore. Like they just won't feel, they'll just feel gray all the time. They will, it will be harder to stimulate them, to make them happy, to drive pleasure. And so, yeah, I don't think it's, uh, I think anyone with kids, if when I have kids, same sort of, same idea, same sort of protocols, tech free for as long as possible. Yeah. And I mean, I am the exception. I don't have any friends, you know, any of her preschool friends who have the same feelings as I do, but, but my, um, professional colleagues like Katie Bowman and Kelly Starrett, like that's what they did too. Like mm -hmm. there's just no reason to, 
to, to do it. I mean, there's no incentive to do it. You know, I talk to my kids if we go, sorry about that. If we go to a restaurant, like I talk to them, we color, we play with the salt shakers. We just, we interact, we engage. And, um, it, it pains me like, you know, my, and my father, like he's ready. He's like, I'm going to buy them some phones and this and that. And I'm like, no, you're not <laughs> like, I won't let you give them that. Yeah. I just, I'll intercept it. Yeah. Well, just imagine like the saddest thing that I ever see is when I'm sitting at a cafe now and then mom and dad are on their phones, not talking, but then yeah. baby in the pram and toddler at the table all are all on their devices. And I'm like, you Can't may as well not, you know, no. I saw, you know, not be a family because you're just existing in well, a digital world. You would really like Dr. Porges' work because, um, you know, he talks about the social engagement system and this is, this really is, it's about face-to-face connection and it's about actually your ability to read faces, to be able to detect safety, to be able to detect danger, um, to be able to pick up on social cues. And that's an organic biological thing. Like that's something that's actually hardwired into us, but we can um, buff it away by like, you know, by dampening our own internal reflexes. So I want to keep them sharp in, in their ability to have face-to-face communication and to learn play because play is hardwired into our bodies and play is not meant to be played with the device. Play is meant to be played with other organisms. Mm. So we should be playing with our pets. We should be playing with other people we should not be playing in isolation with tech because tech does not give us true, um, um, true play. Mm. Yeah. Well, the neurotransmitter oxytocin is extremely important for feelings of like love and joy and connection. Yes. And the, the most um, easy, like one of the fastest things you can do to release it is to have uh, skin contact with another human. Yes. Um, and so, if you're just avoiding that for a long period of time and people that do, they're, they're often depressed or they often don't feel any sort of joy because they're not releasing any of that neurochemical. And exactly. Like said, they, they wear their suit, they act professional, they might live by themselves and they don't, you know, interact or, you know, get touched by other people and it sounds weird but it's it's true. They miss that play element, right? And like you were saying earlier to massage, it's like massaging is a great way mm. to get that. Um, mm-hmm. to get that thing but some people don't like that so they, they miss it there as well so it's just like compounding and then it could be years and years and years before they've really had that um, that, that good release of that neurochemical and it's, it's hard well, well the, and the vagus nerve is peppered with oxytocin receptors like that is its neurochemical mm. um, and by the way Dr. Porges' wife is Sue Carter who is the international expert on oxytocin like she's the one like the reason you're even talking about oxytocin is because of the studies Sue did. nobody's re- researching oxytocin until she did oxytocin and vasopressin and prairie voles so you should definitely look into into her work or even if you want to make it like easy on yourself read a book called oh and i have it on number four so i'm not going to mention it i'll mention <laughs> it on question four. we'll get it we'll get to it good um, i think we're i think we're on a wavelength here yeah, yeah. about this like, um cool so third question is um third question is is there anything recently that you changed your mind on that for a while was a strong health belief oh yeah (laughs) that's a good one that was really easy to answer and that is that stretching was the best thing for me above all things right yeah yeah it's it's funny it's funny what not the best thing for me above all things yeah, yeah it's funny what gets so um like in just mainstream thought right what what is so important for people and then what is also um, just not important for people at all. Like it's funny, you, like if you talk about free weights, right? So just, you know, moving other like objects in space or like a lot of the public don't really think that they're very safe or that they're very good for you, um, free weights. I'm like, this is like important. If you pick up a couch or if you, you know, put your luggage in an overhead compartment, that's free weights. Like it's the same thing. And the people think it's unsafe. I'm like, well, how are you going to get your luggage into the into the thing without hurting yourself? But then people almost everyone thinks that they, they need to like stretch a lot, you know. I understand stretching has its place, right? Stretching can be good. But if you ask, you could almost ask, 95% of people would say, oh, yeah, yeah, you should stretch a lot, like heaps of stretch. It's like vegetables. Yeah. Like you can't, no one's like overrated with vegetables. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm in a hospital. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Vegetables. But I think what you're it's saying all, is... I mean, it's all important. Like 
but it, that's the thing is if it's any one thing becomes the most important thing, you, you need to question your, that your isolation, Iso- isolationism, mm-hmm. right? So we can isolate ourselves in our homes and not let ourselves get touched and like have everything really sterile. Um, and we can be that way about free weights or we can be that way about kettlebells or we can be that way about, mm-hmm. you know, running, we can be that way about stretching. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we need lots of different things mm-hmm. to be a good, a good stew mm-hmm. of a human. So uh, it's always going to depend, uh, of course, on the, on the person. But as a generalization, if you had a room yeah. of 100 people and you were giving them stretching advice, uh, what would hit, uh, what would be like the most effective sort of protocol that you could give for um, just sort of gen pop people? Um, well, I've always taught a lot of dynamic stretching and I've always taught PNFs within dynamic stretching. So that's one of the hallmarks of the yoga tune-up mobility work is that we've always included um, contractile elements within our stretching protocols. So I think the word stretch in and of itself is, 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 you know, it's like, Oh my God, just like myofascial release. It's like, okay, okay. You know, there's so many different types of stretch and whatnot, but I guess what I'm referring to as that stretching is the best thing from uh, above all things is that it's static stretching. Yeah. So um, I think you just, you need to have a lot of variety there. So, um, you know, and, for yeah, for Gen Pop, like I'm super comfortable teaching um, experienced um, athletes and grandmas in the same room because I I ask for such a strange Tetris of of actually very very simple movement from my students and um, uh, people are lacking a lot of coordination and elegance in the simplest of actions in their body. And so, you know, I cl- try to clarify joint articulations and planes of movement. Um, and it's very hard for people to not couple or overcomplicate uh, movement. So for me, it's, it's really fun. And then we usually have to regress into some rolling on the roll balls to excite the proprioceptors so that people can then sense what I'm asking them to do. And then we pendulate back and forth in that way. Mm. Awesome. And that's really what my programming is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Live better in your body and, and find your body blind spots um, and using these, these different movement tools or rolling tools, or consciousness tools, breath tools to uh, find yourself where you were lost in your body. I would love for her to have a look at your condition, Raph, maybe, maybe at the end of the show. Mm. Um, so final question is, do you have a quote or do you have and or uh, a book recommendation for the audience? Yeah, I want to recommend, I want to recommend like a million books, besides my own, of course, yeah. the role model. Role model. But um, it's so funny, you were talking so heavily about oxytocin. So maybe I was just being very psychic when I wrote this down, because I haven't written this book down in a while. Mm. But the book is called A General Theory of Love. And it's about the the physiology of love. So I used to have very bad relationships with with men, with, you know, guys I was dating. And when I read this book, I started to understand why I was feeling the way I was feeling and why my attachment to bad relationships was so strong. And it really helped me to get in touch with what things were sparking in my physiology that was creating so much drama in my life. And I didn't know polyvagal theory or Stephen Porges at the time, I, this was, um, uh, they talk a lot about his wife in this book, Sue Carter and oxytocin. So I just highly recommend it for anybody who is like lucky in love or unlucky in love, but a general theory of love is just so good. I've read it like nine times. So you should read it too. Do you, do you mind sharing maybe like one example that was a personal one of you that helped explain like the physiology thing? Oh gosh. <sighs> I might be a bit too personal. Um, well, I no. I mean, I can you know to go. Let's go back to touch. So there's there's one study that they talk about in this book, and it's heartbreaking for me. Um, there was a king, and I can't remember what century. I'm like just some idiot king in the fifth century or something, and he wanted <laughs> to know what the what the um, natural language of humans was. He wanted to know what the organic language of humans was. And so they basically kidnapped a bunch of babies, a bunch of newborns, and they put them in a room together 
And there were wet nurses that would nurse the children, but they wouldn't talk to them and they wouldn't touch them other than nursing them. And um, all of the babies died. And the babies died from lack of touch and from not being spoken to. This is such a horrible story. Um, but you just think of how important connection, touch, and communication is for our ability to, to groom one another as mates, as friends, as collaborators, as colleagues. I mean, these are the, fun, the, the fundamental language of humans is connection. It's not disconnection. So, um, you know, there you have it. Mm. Yeah. For a depressing note to end on. Yeah, I have heard that one before. I think they've done it like quite a few times in history. It's called like the forbidden experiment. Um, where they just like have like the baby. It never works out. Like the, they never like have their never. own language or anything like that. It's it's not like on their own. There's like some special unique human one. Like you just learn it from the people around you. Mm. Interesting. Um, and then do you have a quote as well, Jill? And or? Oh, a quote. Um, just the only quote I ever remember is the Oscar Wilde quote, be yourself, everyone is taken. Nice. That is a great my quote. my only quote I ever remember, so there you have it. That's good. Um, Jill, you've shared a lot of uh, really powerful insights on this podcast. I'll probably have to go and listen to it again, take some notes. Um, but if people want to find out more about you and some of the stuff that you do, can you uh, just direct them to whatever you feel is appropriate? My website is tuneupfitness.com. We have 500 teachers worldwide that teach yoga tune-up and role model work um, in almost every continent, not Antarctica, on the planet. And um, follow me on Instagram. That's where a lot of my strong opinions and cool information is. That's at yoga tune-up on Instagram. We also have a brand page on Instagram, which is at tuneupfitness. And if that's where the giveaways are, so if you look for free stuff, nice. You know, better go to tune up in this, but if you want, you know, to hear my opinions about hip replacements, fascia, momming, uh, movement, come over there. And then, of course, Facebook, the same accounts. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Oh, actually, no, you can find me at Jill Miller at, on Facebook and then tune up in this. And then I encourage you to take a look at the role model book if you are interested in developing your own rolling practice. And then, of course, we educate. We have eight teacher trainings that cover many of the things that you and I discussed today. And uh, we'd love to have you in there. Amazing. It's been a long time since I got my ball. Where do you, uh, where do you get the balls now in Australia and America? In Australia, Perform Better Australia has them. Um, some of our local teachers also have them. So you can always go to the website and put in your zip code or whatever you know code. And, I get, and that will populate and you'll see um, some of our local uh, Australian teachers. We have teachers in Perth. Um, we have teachers in Brisbane, I believe, in Queensland, in Sydney. I don't remember all the cities in <laughs> Australia. Right. Yeah, they sound familiar. Yeah, I'm sure you'll. I'm sure uh, people will be able to find them if they want to find them. Um, Jill, yes. that was, and I'll uh, be teaching. Actually, I'll be teaching in London. If any, there are any UK people here, um, I'll be teaching in London for the first time in many, many years on December fourth and fifth at Tri Yoga. Um, and that is the role model trainings, but I have lots of courses all the way up to the end of the year here in the U S breath and bliss core, core immersion, and the rolling along the anatomy trains that I'm doing with Tom Myers in August in the wilds of Maine. Awesome. Amazing. Thanks so much for being on Julie. Really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Great.